Today's meeting is the first meeting of that um, part, and we're going to focus on roles, partnerships, and charter types. Next. There we go. Hi, I'm Diana McEwen. I know many of you. I direct the Metro CERT region, Clean Energy Resource Teams, at the Great Plains Institute. And I get to be your um, mistress of ceremonies um, for these, this cohort. And I'm super excited to be here with you all. And we'll go around and we will do introductions. Um, Many of you who were part of the first Cities Charging Ahead know that I love icebreakers. I like to get to know you, and I think it's good to get to know each other. So we like to do a little, you know, when we do our um, introductions, not just your name, um, but we usually have a little interesting thing to share. And keep it kind of short. Um, so go ahead and do the next slide. And what we're going to do is your name, your city or organization, and then, um, what was your first car? Um, and keep it short. If you've got a little short story, okay, but try to keep it short because we've got a lot of people on the call. Um, so what was your first car and did it have a name? Um, some people have names for their cars. Um, so I'll start and then what I'll do is I'll call people and tell you if you're um, um, on deck um, so that we can go through this um, seamlessly, hopefully. My name, as I said, Diana, and I'm with the Great Plains Institute and direct certs in the metro region. My first car uh, was a 1963 Corvair, and it was baby blue, and I was only 15 when I got it um, from my dad, and it did not have a name. Um, so I will go ahead and um, I'll have Randy go next, and then Ellen, you're on deck. I think you said Brandy, so. I, go ahead. I said okay. Randy, but you go, because oh, it's yeah. in your name. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. So, uh, Brandy Top, okay. I'm with the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe here in North Central Minnesota, um, working in their environmental department. My first car, I'm trying to think of what it was. I think it was a Colt. Um, it was a little car. I didn't have a name for it, but I was the only one that could drive it because you had to have a big enough hand to do the double shifting of the two shifters to go from high and into fourth gear. So uh, it was my car. <laughs> Love it. All right, so we'll go to Randy and then Ellen. Okay, uh, my name is Randy McLaughlin. I'm the chair of the Red Wing Sustainability Commission. And uh, my first car was, <clears throat> I don't know what the year it was, but it was about 1971 um, that I had it and it was very, and it was used then. It was a Carmen Ghia, very dirty, worn out thing called Wash Me Please. <laughs> nice. Ellen and then Allie. Good morning, everybody. This is Ellen Brenna from Shoreview, a natural resources coordinator. My first car was a 92 Ford Taurus. It did not have a name, but it did leak power steering fluid like nobody's business. So that was. That was a challenge. Um, I've also got Maria Freges here. She's the city's intern, and uh, I'll let her describe her first car. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> gosh, I don't even re remember. We, I have many brothers and sisters, so we all shared vehicles. But I think it was uh, Buick Regal, and I don't know the year and the name of it. My brother named it. Her name was Shanigua. And <laughs> she had a hole in the floor, and the, the AC didn't work, and the windows were duct taped up. <laughs> because they wouldn't roll back up again. <laughs> that is awesome. And I'm going to ask people, when you introduce yourself, if you mind um, putting your video on so people can connect a name and a face, that would be awesome. Hi, you guys. <laughs> I love the social distancing and the masks. You guys are so good. Thanks. Allie, and then um, we'll have Leslie go. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Sorry, my phone's kind of acting up. Um, hi, I'm Allie. I'm from the city of Invergrove Heights. Um, I'm their environmental specialist. And my first car was a Chevy Blazer, used bright red. Um, and we called it Muju because that's what the license plate said. So 
don't know. I don't think it beats Shaniqua or whatever that other <laughs> name was. <laughs> well, that was a good one. Well there, so. Awesome. Thank you. We'll have Leslie go and then Connie. Hi, I'm Leslie from Marina St. Croix. My first car was a 67 Chevy Impala that I called the Great White Whale. <laughs> Perfect. Connie and then Chris. Hi, my name is Connie Taylor and I'm with the City of White Bear Lake. I'm the environmental specialist there. And my first car, um, I was a senior in high school. It was actually a Mazda pickup truck. And it was a stick shift and I didn't know how to drive a stick shift. So my dad had to drive it home from the dealer and then I had to drive it to work the next day and learn how to drive a stick shift really quickly. Um, but I do not, I did not name my, name that truck. All right, uh, Chris and then Caitlin. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Chris Acuna, and I'm with the Great Plains Institute. Uh, my first car was a Chevy Cavalier. Um, it was two door, um, and it was black, so we named it the Batmobile. Perfect. And especially considering what I know about you is that you're, you know, Mr. Uh, superhero movie guy, so that totally makes sense. Uh, Caitlin and then Ann. Hi, Caitlin Bachland from Great Plains Institute. Um, my first car was a 2000 Ford Taurus and it did not have a name. So we'll have yeah. Ann, Ann and then Eric. I'm Ann Reich, a volunteer with the Marine on St. Croix Green Steps Committee. Um, my first car was a 1977 Toyota Corolla. No name, no air conditioning, no frills. <laughs> awesome okay so I said Eric and if you're able to turn on your video so people can see your face that's awesome so we can put names and faces together so Eric and then David all right Eric from the city of Golden Valley um, now my first is my second car because it's more fun my second car is was a 1986 Buick Somerset and it was it had so many you know, so many things wrong with every major system and component that my friends called it the silver bomb. And that the best part was showing up for a professional internship at the Headwaters Regional Development Commission up in Bemidji, um, you know, all dressed up and everything else, pull in and because I couldn't, uh, the tumbler where they, with the key, the ignition didn't work, I couldn't take the key out to shut off the car. I had to get out, pop the hood and disconnect the battery cable in order to shut the car off. <laughs> So it would turn on. I just couldn't turn it off and back the key out. So that was like the, the best part. They'd let the, the staff would look out the window and laugh at me every morning when I did that. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. Oh my gosh. Okay. Now I've kind of lost. I think I have Dave next and then uh, Melissa Bartman. Uh, Dave Wanberg, city of Faribault. First car was a 1971 old Cutlass, no name. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. And Melissa and then Sam. Good morning, everybody. My name is Melissa Bartman. I'm with the city of Red Wing and my first car was a Chevy Celebrity. It didn't have a name, um, but the fabric uh, on the roof and the inside was coming off. So all of my friends would carve their names in the foam. So kind of fun. That's funny. Um, okay, so Sam and then um, I think that's Andy from Shockbeat. Um, so Sam? Yeah, Sam Bazina, the city of Rochester. My, my video is not easily accessible here, but uh, okay. my, first, my first car was a 1993 Saturn SL2 twin cam. I was, I was real hard on that car. I, I didn't respect it enough to give it a name. <laughs> All right, Andy and then Bill. Oh, shared office space, computer doesn't have it. Okay, so I'm gonna read what Andrew um, said from, uh, I think it's Andrew Bowker. I don't know if I'm saying that right. In a shared office space and his computer does not have a webcam, his name is Andrew. Um, 
Barker Boucher, and he's a planner with the city of Shakopee. He had a 1996 Plymouth Breeze, which he brought from his great aunt, who was a nun, and named it Yeezy because he had a major Kanye phase in high school. You're showing your age, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Um, so Bill and then Annie. Uh, my name is Bill uh, Kennedy. I'm from the Hackensack City Council, Hackensack, Minnesota. And my first car was a restored 67 Camaro that my dad and I worked on. And I remember changing the gear shift from the column to put it on the floor. So you had four on the floor. And we painted it uh, primer red and then we never got it done after that. So it was always a rust primer red Camaro running around town. Nice. Same though, but Rust, rust primer red. Awesome. So I think that I say, did we do Sam? I said Annie. So Annie next. Hi, everyone. I'm Annie Potter from um, the city of St. Louis Park. I'm a sustainability specialist there. And my first car was a Honda CRV, and its name was Garfunkel. <laughs> awesome. Um, so um, I'll have um, Rissy and then Emily. Hey, did you say Rissy? Did you say me? Rissy, I did. Sorry. Yes. Okay. I was just making sure. No. Uh, my name is Rissy. I'm for the. I work for the city of Edina. I'm the city management fellow. Um, currently standing in for our sustainability coordinator as we're in the process of hiring a new one. So you guys might not see me after this, as we there might be a new person soon. Uh, my first car was a 06 Toyota Corolla. Her name was Penelope Penny for short. Wow. I'm impressed with the name. Okay, Emily, and then uh, then I'll do Jen. Hi, good morning, everybody. Emily Ziering with the city of St. Louis Park. Uh, my first car was a 1986 Honda Accord, and her name was Natalie because I sang a lot of 10,000 Maniacs in the car. I love 10,000 Maniacs. Okay, so Jen, and then I'll just say um, Andrew's last name is pronounced Boucher. So thank you to my colleague, um, Caitlin, who always has my back. Um, so who did I say? John Howard and then Drew. Oh, no, I said Jen. Sorry, Jen, you're next, and then John. Uh, Jen McLaughlin, City of Woodbury. I'm a sustainability specialist there. And I, um, my first car was a little red Chevette. So that was enough of a name. <laughs> All right, so John Howard, then Drew. Hi, this is John Howard. I'm a sustainability coordinator with the city of Winona. Uh, my first car was a 1997 uh, Volvo S7, S70 sedan. It's a rest me red color, uh, and I called it the tank. <laughs> All right, Drew and then Jeff. Hello, good morning. My name is Drew Ingvelson. I work at the city of Minnetonka as a planner. And my first car was a hand-me-down that was driven by both my grandparents and mother. And it was a 1995 Taurus station wagon. And you're not very creative. I think I just called it the wagon. So, come on. That's awesome. All right. So it's, there's a lot of young. So Jeff and then Tom Kiefer. Jeff is on mute. How's that? Okay. Is that better? Better. Is that better? Yep. Yes. City of Apple Valley, fleet maintenance supervisor. Oh, great. My first car was a 73 Dodge Charger. No name. That's a nice car. Um, okay. So um there's a person on here. Um, oops, I lost somebody there. I'm trying to, I had one other person on here that had a, oh, D. Chirpich. I don't know who that is. 
Yeah, hi, my name is Drew Chirpik. Uh, I'm the environmental specialist for the city of Golden Valley. And my first car was an O2 Ford Focus wagon. Um, it did not have a name. And then I, I think Tim Kiefer. Sorry, I said Tom. Uh, Tim Kiefer, City of Golden Valley Public Works. And my first car was an 89 Ford Ranger. No name. Awesome. I think that is everyone. Did I miss anyone? Golden Valley is out here in force. That's awesome. Like going all in. And I just want to point to the, the slide that you see. Um, the picture in the upper right corner is from the very first meeting of cities charging ahead in the metro region uh, last time around. So um, that's exciting to have that picture. And then below it is a picture with some of the um, Red Wing folks um, at one of the meetings. So you'll see some of the faces. There's some familiar faces. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, really good to kind of get to know people a little bit and see your faces, hear your names. Um, so I'm just going to do kind of a little short overview of the cohort, um, the description, kind of talk about the participants, and then where you'll be able to find the materials um, uh, as we go take this journey together. Uh, so just a description, um, you know, kind of we're back, um, you know, this is um, cities charging ahead. We didn't have, you know, 1.0 or, you know, whatever. So we're calling this 2.0. So uh, maybe it's cities charging ahead classic, the original, I don't know. Um, but we're back. And, you know, again, it's called cities charging ahead, but we also um, in both um, the previous one and now um, have at least one tribal nation. We're really happy to have you with us. Um, and really to help you kind of get those projects across the finish line. We really want to have um, give you as much research, as many resources and uh, technical assistance as we can to help you really get get those projects done. Um, it's we're really building on what we did in the previous cohort um, and really deepening that learning. We've learned more. We have more case studies, more cities that have done things, more examples, um, and we're hoping that that really can accelerate um, kind of EV use in communities. Um, as you may or may not know, we love. Um, EV or car puns, so you'll see them throughout. Bear with us. You know, we have to have fun. So um, this first cohort that we're, you know, starting and that we're doing here in September is going to be focused on electric vehicle charging. Um, and we did that in particular because we're anticipating the request for proposal for level two electric vehicle chargers to be released in the fall. So we're really hoping this will really get you ready um, to take advantage of that, apply for those funds for level two charging. Um, you know, just to let you know the, the um, RFP for DC fast charging along corridors in greater Minnesota came out last week. Um, you know, we will talk about that and we will work with the communities that that applies to, but for the most part, it's um, a fewer um, cities and you don't apply for that yourself. A developer applies for the whole corridor. So um, if you're on those corridors, we can help you get connected and help you kind of think through some things. Um, and I know Winona and Red Wing, who we worked with in the first one, were really bummed when they weren't on the corridor um, for the first phase, but they are now. So we're happy um, for them. And they can take advantage of that. Future cohorts um, will include sessions on city fleets and how to add, you know, do fleet analysis for your fleets and add electric vehicles to your fleets. And we have a number of cities that have done that already. And then um, probably the way that you can have the biggest impact um, with electric vehicles is really looking at those standards for private development in your communities and we'll um, we haven't set dates or timelines but probably early you know probably January um, is when we'll do that piece and so we hope you can join us for those it's up to you you can choose to be part of the charging one and then maybe you know you're not looking at a fleet vehicle so you don't participate in that one um, or you're, you're not going to look at one now but in the future and you want to get some more information so you participate um, or, you know, you participate in the other one. It's a little bit a la carte. Um, we'd love to have you um, join us for all of them if you're able, um, but we understand that there's lots going on and if it doesn't, doesn't pertain to you, it's okay. We're not gonna, we're not gonna um, uh, call you out for not participating in a, in a part of the cohort that doesn't make sense for you. 
Um, we put a link in here, and I, I think we we had it in all of the promo, um, you know, the pages and the resources that we have on Drive Electric about Cities Charging Ahead, including the story um, and kind of what that was um, that happened in 2018 and 2019. All right, Caitlin. So. Um, very excited to show you at this point uh, participants i mean if some other cities decide they want to try to hop on and watch the recording and then kind of jump on you know we're not going to say no but as of right now these are the cities that are involved so we have 29 cities across the state um, many of them in the metro but definitely um, cities across the state. I highlighted in yellow the ones that are coming back for more. Um, so, um, you know, when uh, 14, you know, half of the participants from the first cities charging had come back, that feels like me like an endorsement about this work and this process that they're coming back for more. Um, a lot of cities were just learning during that process, kind of taking in the information, in talking to the other city staff and council members, et cetera, about that work, and maybe you know they're back to they really want to take some action, beginning action, and um, the um, and and you know looking at um, you know your opportunities, you know if you want if you want to take more action. I know there's some cities here. St. Louis Park has done a lot of work, but they're back, um, you know, perhaps to get some more. Um, information about taking additional action. Um, and Brandy, your question, um, it, that's you, Cass Lake is you, I can change it. Um, that was what was said on the, um, it was said Cass Lake was in the survey, so I can change that, it's not a problem. So I will go ahead and take care of that. Uh, all right, so we're gonna talk um, overview of roles. I think one of the questions that cities often have at the beginning is, you know, I don't even know what role the city can play with regards to um, accelerating electric vehicle deployment in their community. So there are a number of different roles that you can play. Um, you can install infrastructure. Um, you and you know we'll talk more about kind of that partnering piece. But you know you can do it with your utility. You can do it by yourself. You can partner with the community. There's a lot of different ways um, that you can help kind of put that infrastructure in place that help people with one of the bigger barriers, which is range anxiety, and we'll talk about that more in, in the future. Um, most of that is a perceived um, barrier because um, with the range of vehicles, um, their mile range, and with the infrastructure that's in place, most folks, if you drive 100 miles or less a day, can, can, do, can have an electric vehicle. And, um, and, you know, the, the biggest piece of that is most charging happens at night, at home, overnight. So, um, you know, but it's an important piece um, to have infrastructure available in a community. So another role that you can play is to encourage community businesses to install electric vehicle charging. Um, some of you have probably seen there's a number of companies that have decided it's kind of standard operating procedure, you know, Goodwill was early in the game, um, doing a lot of um, charging at their, their stores, Hy-Vee, London Byerly's, we're seeing some more at Target. Um, there's, there's, you know, businesses, both bigger chain businesses, but you can look to um, encourage businesses or business um, uh, entities, chamber, uh, or um, uh, of a business association in your community um, to install um, as, a, as an attraction to their business district. Uh, another thing that you can do is to connect residents, businesses and institutions in your community to resources. Um, ed basic education to understand there's a lot of, I think, myths still out there about electric vehicles, um, you know, how to, um, you know, uh, all kinds of different, you know, resources that you can connect them to. Um, to really, you know, understand how if they are interested in, you have a nonprofit organization that is really thinking they have sustainability goals and they want to, you know, install a charger, you can help connect those, those um, businesses and residents and institutions to resources. And then lastly, you know, generally educating the community about electric vehicle charging and, you know, the locations that they, they, there are in your community. That is a really, really important piece. Um, I think, you know, in the past, um, Red Wing especially expressed, um, you know, the need to help really educate their community about 
um, electric vehicles and charging infrastructure as they were going through their process. So, um, you know, really, um, you know, an important piece is to, you have a role, you have a mechanism to communicate to your community, they look to you, and so you can really help educate uh, members of your community about electric vehicle charging and, and locations. All right. And I just want to add one quick thing yeah. on here. Um, there is nothing that would preclude cities or communities from only doing one of these things. So, um, you know, there's nothing that says that you have to do one of these. You can choose to do all of them. And in some communities, you, you know, your city, you might be the only member out there that's, that's really educating people about electric vehicles. So it can be really helpful to kind of take a step back, assess what your community needs and the other players that are out there in your community and, and really examine like, how can your city itself, um, you know, be additive in the process and kind of build on other efforts or if there aren't any efforts, maybe you wanna do all of these. Good point. And so you'll notice that we're a team, Caitlin and Chris and I. So thank you, Caitlin, for jumping in. Yes, you can do all of these things. <laughs> I'll take all of everything on the menu. So thank you for that. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about some partnership opportunities. Um, I think early on when we were in cities charging ahead, we talked a lot about um, we were focused on the city taking action. Um, and, and, you know, Sometimes, you know, especially with charging infrastructure, there's the cost associated and um, some cities, you know, can afford that, especially with a level two, it's a much um, cheaper kind of price point than like a DC fast charger. Um, but, you know, really looking for opportunities um, to partner and um, the, there's a lot of great benefits to that. One being um, the more partners that are involved, the more that more people that will be talking about and sharing information, getting people to those charging stations. So, um, so you know, local businesses, chambers, business associations, economic development agencies. You know, I think more and more we're seeing um, you know folks in in that realm really look at um, electric vehicle charging as an opportunity to to draw in um, people that drive electric. And you know there, you know there's a wide variety of vehicles out there, um, but I think you know for the most part, you know analysis of EV owners are a little bit um, higher, uh, more education, a little higher income, probably people you want to come to your business district um, to spend money, and um, and so you know I think they're seeing a, an opportunity to really um, draw people in. Um, so that's a, a great great um, opportunity for businesses and for you to work in partnership with your businesses. And we'll have some examples later. Corporate campuses, we're seeing more and more um, big companies, um, tenant company and others, um, you know, that have um, charging stations, um, Mortensen um, and others that have charging stations. So you can, you know, work with them um, to identify opportunities to partner in, in with electric vehicle charging. Um, you know, the, um, the power producers, and so I actually, sh this should say utilities, my fault, I didn't um, tweak this um, bullet, but uh, utilities definitely, um, you know, work, um, working with your utilities um, is a great opportunity. Um, so those words probably don't mean very much to you guys, but you know, whether it's XL Energy or you have a, you know, local municipal utility, um, to, you know, look to those, um, utilities for some partnership and we'll talk again at the end about that we have some examples um, in particular um, you know XL Energy has really rolled out a number of opportunities um, for their cities um, so um, you know obviously you're gonna you know work with um, you know on your electric vehicle related goals so um, for your city to um, you know look for opportunities and then the last one is level one and two campgrounds. I know for maybe some of you in the metro area, you might not have campgrounds in your area. So um, I, you know, it would be really, um, you know, it's good for you to look at opportunities. Those campgrounds have um, all, they have regular outlets, but a lot of them have um, uh, 240 outlets for RVs. And so those could serve as level two chargers. And um, we did some projects uh, last summer or the summer, we, last summer 
to um, call up some campgrounds and have them added to the plug share map so that people could um, utilize those. Um, and this is just, I want to share that this picture is actually um, Ellen Brenna is right there standing by the charger in Shoreview when they just um, installed their charger this past um, June. And so um, that definitely was a partnership and she'll chime in a little bit later about that. All right, go ahead, Caitlin. And just want to flag that we did get a question through the chat um, from Andy. Oh, sure. Wondering about the Excel Energy programs for communities or for cities. And I know, Diana, you've been working with Excel Energy on that, but I can't remember if we're getting into that a little bit later in this webinar or if that comes later. I, I, I do have one slide. I'm going to talk about one particular program. Um, and so I'll, I'll touch base on that a little bit as well. Yeah a little bit later. So thank you for that, Andy. So um, one of my favorite partnership examples is Red Wing. Um, the Red Wing was, um, they, they, they really wanted to have a DC fast charger. Um, they applied for a search grant. We do seed grants every other year and they applied for a search grant in the Southeast region and um, got that, that um, that funding and they they really needed some partnership to help pay for this the city didn't have quite uh, the money that they were looking for and they had a great advocate um, a number of great advocates but especially Bill Gain and he's in this picture um, and and they were really creative about how they did this and when they um, needed some money they went to the uh, the local chamber and the local chamber was really on board and so they put this charger in an area um, you can see there's um, retail around it and they talked to uh, a number of the businesses and offered an opportunity for a sum of money they could have a um, a placard there was a placard on the charger and um, they could have the name of the business that help provide funding for that charger. And, um, you know, uh, we'll talk more about this later, but a dumb charger just is a charger. You don't, you don't have the capability to charge people for it. It just doesn't have quite the, you can't kind of gather as much data, um, but they really, really wanted to know who was plugging in there. And was it the, was it, was, it, was it residents in Red Wing or was it more kind of tourists and people coming from other places? So um, when they went to, you know, buy a charger and they um, didn't spend as much money, got a dumb charger, they couldn't figure, you know, they couldn't get that information. So what they did was really creative. They put a lockbox on the charger and in order to get the little credit card swiper that you could swipe and and start charging your car for free but you know their credit you know kind of card you had to t uh you had to um uh, type in the um your zip code and so that gave them information about where people were coming from so they could figure out you know where most of the charging um you know those those electric vehicle owners were coming from and that really helps make the case um, you know, is it more tourism? Is it more folks um, from um, Red Wing? So that was a really creative way to do that. And then they would send you um, the lockbox number um, once you did, you know, texted them and you could get the card and swipe. Um, it was a partnership with the city staff, commission members, businesses, volunteers. Um, it was really quite a partnership and um, hoping that, you know, we can um, hear a little bit more about that later today. Maybe Melissa or Randy could, um, um, weigh in and, um, and and maybe even next week um, we can talk about that more. So that's one example. Um, some other partnerships, um, the city of Hutchinson um, worked really closely with their municipal utility um, to install. The city had a piece of property, the utility, you know, worked to, you know, pay for the charger and, um, and they worked in partnerships. So working with your municipal, municipal utility, like I said, so the city of Hutchinson did that. Um, uh, Woodbury, um, I think Jen will mention, um, uh, talk a little bit of, um, more kind of a little bit later about some of the work that they're doing. Um, again, this is that XL Energy. It's a pilot um, for fleets. Um, it's really for fleets, but it, you know, then allows you, um, it, you know, a partnership with them that helps install the charging infrastructure 
um, as part of that, that pilot. And then um, again, that level one and two campgrounds opportunity to, to partner with um, them to just have chargers available in your community that can be put on PlugShare. All right, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin Bachman. All right, um, so I'm going to be covering kind of like a, a level 201 <laughs> about electric vehicle charging stations. And so for some of you that were here with us in the early days of Cities Charging Ahead, some of this information might feel a little familiar, um, but to others it might be the first time you're hearing it. So hopefully I don't dumb it down too much uh, <laughs> and provide the right level of information for you all. All right, so just to kind of recap um, all of the charging standards that are currently available in Minnesota, uh, we have three types of fast chargers, what we would call DC fast chargers, which are the Chatamo, the CCS, and Tesla supercharger. And for level two, that's primarily J1772. And then Tesla does have, you know, kind of its own proprietary um, level two as well. Um, there's also the NEMA standard uh, that is, less common, I would say. And then of course you have the outlet um, as kind of a level one. And so, you know, going from left to right on this screen here, obviously all of the DC fast chargers, those are gonna give you the most um, mileage per hour in terms of refueling your electric battery. Uh, level one is going to give you the slowest charge. Uh, so you'll have to plug in for, you know, depending on the size of your battery, you'll have to plug in possibly, you know, 17 hours if it was fully depleted. Um, if it's not fully depleted and you're not driving a ton, like a lot of us aren't now, uh, you know, you can usually leave a vehicle plugged in overnight and it will be fully charged in the morning on an outlet. Um, so for the DC fast chargers, uh, there, there's been a little bit of an update here. Uh, the United States is now gravitating more towards CCS. And so the new Nissan Leafs, well actually, I don't even think it's gonna be Nissan Leaf. Their next version of an electric car uh, will actually use the CCS standard. And so Chatamo is slowly phasing out in the US, but it's still being used for older vehicles and vehicles still on the road today. Um, so as you're thinking about putting in charging stations, you know, you might want to consider putting in both Chatamo and Ch CCS if you're thinking about a DC fast charger application. That will just enable the most vehicles to use, to be able to use that charging station. Um, as far as the Tesla supercharger goes, that one is only used by Tesla. They do not have an adapter. So if you are driving a Nissan Leaf, or a Chevy Bolt, there is no adapter on the market that would enable you to charge at a Tesla supercharger. So important thing to keep in mind, especially, you know, Tesla does have a destination program um, and they, they don't always follow up and <laughs> put charging stations where you want them to, but they do have a destination program available. Uh, you know, the caveat is that all of those charging stations that they put in are going to be Tesla superchargers. And so they can only be used by Tesla vehicles. Um, they will install, I think it's two level two charging stations in addition to that, that more vehicles can use with the J1772 standard. Um, so that's kind of a, a quick overview on charging standards. 
Um, also wanted to provide just some brief information on use cases in terms of like where we're seeing these charging stations available. And so the three use cases are really public charging, workplace charging, and fleet charging. For most of these, level two is going to be a good way to go. Although uh, if you're looking at public charging, DC fast charging is a really good use case and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit later. Um, but if you're wanting to provide the quickest charge available and you're situated close to a highway, that can be a really good place to install a DC fast charger because again, the goal is get people fueled up as quickly as possible and get them back on the road. Um, whereas with a level two, it's gonna take longer for people to charge. And so those, uh, those use cases are better for applications such as like a grocery store or a movie theater um, or a park, somewhere that people are gonna spend more time. And so they'll have something to do while their vehicle is charging. Uh, with workplace, we typically see level two charging, uh, not really DC fast charging, unless you're wanting to charge like a a heavier duty vehicle such as a bus. <laughs> um, but for the most part, you're just going to be seeing level two at workplaces because again, people are typically working for eight hours a day. So their vehicle can sit in the parking lot and charge for longer. Uh, fleet charging, again, primarily probably going to be level two unless you're needing to move vehicles in and out very quickly. Um, it just ultimately depends on your fleet needs and the vehicle needs, what size of battery you have, how quickly is it being depleted. Um, so sometimes we see DC fast charging stations uh, being used for fleets. Uh, so then I wanted to provide some information on common features that we see in charging stations just to get you thinking about you know if you are looking at installing charging stations here are some features that you probably want to be thinking about um, before you actually start looking at equipment and so the first consideration is going to be do you want to install a dumb or a smart charging station so a dumb one uh, it's going to be the most basic charging station there is. So what that means is it will not offer data tracking. Uh, you can't collect payments on it. Um, you can't uh, control it remotely. Uh, so it's just going to be the very basic charging station there is in terms of providing that level two. Um, but because it doesn't have any other features, uh, it, it's also the least expensive. And so it can be more budget friendly, but just keep in mind that if you're wanting some of those features like data tracking, um, being able to collect payment on them, you're gonna wanna go with a smart charger. Um, so smart charger sometimes is also referred to as a networked charger. Uh, and it's going to be more expensive, but uh, at the same time, you will have more control over that charging station. And so, especially when you get into fleet considerations, for example, um, it will likely be more cost effective for you to put in a lot of smart chargers where you can manage that load uh, remotely than to put in a dumb charging station, a dumb level two, and have uh, less control over how that charging station is used. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, and then obviously uh, DC fast charging stations on the market today, they are going to be more expensive uh, because they just have more to them. There's more power. And so you're looking at a minimum of $40,000 just for the unit on that one. Uh, so I mentioned this, but one of the features that you can uh, deploy with smart charging stations is collecting payments. And so there's 
two different types of payments. Uh, there's app-based, which is going to be cheaper than a credit card swipe, but you have to have a network membership in order to operate that. So what we mean by network membership is a lot of these level two charging stations are on, let's say, the ChargePoint network or the EVgo network or the GreenLots network. And so if you only deploy an app-based payment system, then that vehicle owner or driver has to have that app and that network membership in order to operate that charging station. Um, if you're looking at credit card swipe or chip reader, it is going to be more expensive, but it offers greater flexibility in terms of more people being able to operate that charging station. Um, you can also have both an app based and a credit card swipe or chip reader on a charging station. Uh, regarding managing charging stations, uh, there's several different things to keep in mind here. So cloud-based software enables you to manage that station remotely, and it's available in all types of smart chargers. Um, there's basic kilowatt hour monitoring, and so that is, it's going to give you um, the ability to look at the total energy consumption over a period of time, but that is only going to be on site. And so if you're looking for more of remote management, then you want to consider uh, using advanced AC monitoring because that can be done anywhere. You just need an ethernet connection for that. Um, so with that, oftentimes you can look at a historical log. Um, and again, it's available on all types of smart chargers. Uh, the last thing here is tracking utilization. So a lot of you are probably going to be interested in how many vehicles are using my station uh, and how frequently are they using it. Uh, so there's features out there that will enable you to track utilization and also enable you to calculate both the fuel savings and emissions reductions of that charging station. Uh, so just something to keep in mind there. Uh, user experience. So there's a few things you can do to improve user experience. Uh, one is using a touch screen. And um, for the most part, you're going to see this on DC fast chargers as opposed to level two charging stations, but it is available on some commercial level twos. Uh, it's just going to give a more user friendly customer interface. Um, I mean, we most of us have touch screens these days on our phones, and so it's just really intuitive. People know how to use them. Um, additionally, if you do have that touch screen, sometimes we see kind of, well, you might have even seen these at some gas stations now where they have a little video for you to watch as you're fueling. And so they're starting to deploy that technology on charging stations as well. And so it can just be another way to generate additional revenue through advertising. Uh, the next thing is considering using a retractable cord. It's just going to be easier because you don't have to think about cord management, right? So after the user is done charging, the cord will just retract back to the station. Uh, you can easily plug it back in to its holder instead of coiling it around. So if you see the background image here, uh, you can see that, and these are charging stations at our office building, uh, but you have to wrap them around the structure there. And when it is freezing cold out, I will tell you these cords are not very friendly. <laughs> um, it, you know, they're, they're more brittle. Uh, they don't wrap around as easily because they're frozen essentially. And so I just generally recommend uh, putting in a retractable cord if you can. Um, it's also going to reduce vandalism or misuse of the cord because, I mean, we can't always guarantee who's going to be using these charging stations. And so if you don't have a retractable cord, there's a greater risk of that cord not being wound up and, you know, let's say in the winter time, 
your parking lot is uh, getting plowed, snow plow runs over it, and there you go. <laughs> uh, now you have to replace a cord, which can be expensive. Uh, so just some things to keep in mind there. And that one, a retractable cord, it's not specific to smart chargers, so it is also available for, for dumb level two stations. Some safety features that you might want to consider are uh, a beacon light. It just increases visibility at night and will reduce some of that vandalism concerns. Um, a docking connector, again, like if you see the background image here, what we're talking about is that little holster. So you plug the thing back, the, the plug back into its holster when done. Um, and it'll also, you know, prevent some accidental disconnection during charging. Uh, it'll power down the station when not in use. And so it can be really helpful. Another consideration is whether you might want to power your station with renewable energy. And there's a couple of different ways to do this. So you can do it direct on site, uh, which will require additional equipment, of course. So you'll need solar panels or a wind turbine or, or something on site uh, to connect to the station. Um, or if you don't have, let's say your building doesn't have high solar potential or it's just too expensive to install that, uh, solar panel on your building, you can subscribe to utility renewable energy programs. Um, so it, it's going to depend obviously on what service area you're in and, and what utility programs are available, but I know a lot of utilities have these programs now and that can be a really great uh, benefit. Um, so some other considerations are if you're looking at a large scale installation. So what we mean by that is it could be a lot of level two stations or it could be one or a few DC fast charging stations. Uh, you know, that's going to impact the electric load on the grid. And so you'll want to work with your utility early in the process. Um, again, I kind of mentioned this before, but that smart charging station load management software is gonna be a lot less expensive uh, to service upgrades um, in terms of like getting the electric infrastructure to a point where uh, you can have a lot of level two stations or a few DC fast charging stations operating in the same area. And so that's why the utility is going to want to know what you're doing um, and so they can help you through that process. Um, so that's kind of my spiel for today. <laughs> uh, and then uh, there's obviously a lot of other things to consider when looking at installing charging stations. And so the next three stations, what we'll be getting into our um, session two is going to be more uh, siting considerations. So how to look for good locations, tips for installation and best practices. Uh, session three, we'll get more into vendors and service, including purchasing, charging stations, maintenance, best practices, lessons learned. And then finally, session four, we'll be looking at how do you fund these things? Um, and then also talking about preparing for those Volkswagen settlement RFPs. And I think we're actually going to get into that a little bit today because uh, those RFPs are coming out soon. Um, so I saw a few things come in through the chat here. Uh, let's see. Yes. It was mostly about the slides. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And Chris got that. So. Yeah. And what we'll do is that Google Drive. Um, I think I didn't talk about that, but we're going to have um, in the first city charging ad, we had this um, SharePoint site where people had to have a login and all that. We're not going to do that. We're going to have a Google um, Drive where we'll put the recording. So you can share that with other staff that maybe missed it or if you missed the meeting and you want to go back and watch we'll have notes and we'll have the slides so you'll be able to access all that through a google drive questions you can either raise your hand virtually take off your sound and ask a question
Um, so from Randy and Red Wing, what about hotels, motels, wherever an EV is sitting for more than a couple hours, ideally there should be a charger. Absolutely. Um, is that, you know, I'll let Caitlin refer to that, um, talk about that, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, so for a hotel or motel, um, you know, level two is probably going to be the right use case there. Um, and I've definitely heard uh, some EV owners, like they specifically look for hotels and motels that have EV charging stations, and that's where they go when they're on vacation. Um, they will not stay at a hotel that doesn't have that. And so that's another great use case uh, for your community. And I think what's really interesting about that, you can help kind of move that market in the way if you're looking for a hotel and you can call the hotel and say, hey, do you have a charging station or a 240 outlet in your parking lot? So then they understand that there's more folks with electric vehicles trying to come to their, uh, their hotel or motel, which just saying hotel motel makes me think of an old brass song. <laughs> I can't, <laughs> can't get it out of my head. Um, but um, so, you know, that's another way, you know, if you're an EV owner, um, you know, calling the hotel and asking them about that, because then that makes them realize that there's demand for that. So that's also really great. And then Anne has a question. Um, any clue when level two RFP will be live? The issue for us is city council meets once a month. So turnaround time can be a challenge with a six week RFP deadline. Goal equals B position ASAP to apply. Good squad goal. Um, you know, the timing on there says fall of 2020. Um, so um, they just put out the, uh, the RFP for the DC fast chargers last week. Um, it's hard to know, I would say in the next two to four weeks, but I, you know, we just don't know exactly. We know fall of 2020, so we're expecting it sooner than later. But the, I think the one they put out last week is due like November 25th. So it's a, it's a pretty long timeline um, that they, they give a, a, a pretty long timeline for that. Um, I don't know, if, Caitlin, do you have anything else to say? And then I'll read the question from Drew that just came in. Um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, there is a decent amount of pre-work that you can do before the RFP actually comes out. Um, and so, uh, you know, GPI and CERT's kind of combined on a webinar and we hosted this back in... July 30th. July, <laughs> thank you, Dinah. You and those dates. Um, <laughs> And so we did record that and it is available and it has information regarding uh, the DC fast charging RFPs and then also level two RFPs and just what you can do now to prepare for that uh, before it actually launches. So that can be helpful as well. And we'll um, send a link to that in the follow up. Um, I don't, it won't be on this, the Google Drive for, um, for cities charging ahead, but we'll send a link to that if, if anybody wants to watch that. And Brandy was one of our presenters. So you'll get to hear Brandy tell their story about their level two um, uh, charger that they got through phase one um, for the Volkswagen settlement. So, um, you know, great to, to have that there. Um, Drew, I am curious if any cities on this call have a free charging station at their city hall. If yes, how much has been the cost of providing the electric um, providing electric, um, the, the free electric, you know, um, charging, um, thinking, you know, kind of long-term costs beyond the building the charging station. And this was a question that came up a lot during the first cities charging ahead is, you know, should I or shouldn't I charge um, for the electricity? And, you know, a couple of years ago, and it might still be the case that, um, the cost because in order to, to charge people for the electricity you have to have a smart charger so that's a little more expensive although we i think recommend a smart charger if you're able to do that um, it's good to have that data and that ability and you can have that smart charger and not charge right away and still have the ability to later charge i, I think once you install it um you know it's you, you want to get people there to install it and then have nobody use it um, doesn't seem like a, you know, a good idea. So a number of cities, I think, originally um, weren't going to charge and then at some point later would charge. Um, and it's, it's pretty small and actually um, for the small amount of charging, it was costing more in the administrative costs to, to process those charges um, versus the cost of the electricity. But if there's a 
city that um, you know wants to talk about that. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, I don't know if I want to point at anybody here. Um, anybody want to chime in on a charger that they have? So that and what they did. Hey, Diana. This is Ellen from Shoreview. Um, hey, I Ellen. Just logged into our uh, our ChargePoint account to check this, and it looks like we have actually paid 36 bucks in electricity since we've, uh, well, it says in the last 30 days. So we installed them in June. So they've been in for a little longer than that. Um, but that's, it seems like that's our average is around $36 a month in electricity. Um, and ours are free for the first two hours. And I don't think anybody's logged, plugged in for more than two hours yet. So. Yeah, and that's another option, you know, that you have it free for a, a certain time frame. Um, you know, so that's, you know, thank you for that. That's a good point. And, you know, $36 for a, a month of charging is pretty small. And again, you know, as everything in 2020, you have to take that with a grain of salt, you know, probably less people out and about at the city hall or at the community center. Um, but, you know, thanks for that real live data um, with your charger. Hey, Diana, this is Brandy. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah we have five level twos that we are not charging on any of those. Um, I don't have the data yet on those. I'm waiting for my intern to start in September and they'll work that up. But it's, it's more of a come use us, come visit us. You know, it's more of a PR. And so we get, if you look at the whole big picture, the PR you get out of it and the good you're doing with it outweighs the small capital cost that it costs. I'm sure it would be more of a $30, $40 cost. We're not worried about it. And you have chargers at your casinos, right? We have at the three casinos, um, we have actually seven chargers um, at those three casinos split up. And then we're looking at importing more into the government side on the buildings. So. Um, that's why we're part of this. We want to expand. Great. Awesome. Thank you both for that. Um, I did notice that a couple people did join after we did introductions. And um, so Alyssa, um, if you are able to chime in and just say your name, city, and um, what your first car was, um, and then Tom O'Donnell, so we can get to know you. Um, oh, she jumped off the call. <laughs> okay, Tom O'Donnell, why don't you tell us who you are? If you can unmute and tell us um, which city you're with. Hey, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hey, I'm with the city of St. Louis Park Fleet Manager. Uh, my first car was a 75 Camaro Rally Sport. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Um, and I, I think Alyssa, I'm maybe, oh, there she is. Maybe she, Alyssa, are you there? Yeah, sorry, everyone. I lost internet connection there for a second. <laughs> That's all good. Tell us your name, which city you're with, and what your first car was. Yeah, so I'm Melissa Swanson. I work for the city of Victoria, and my first car I'm still driving. It is a Chevy Cruze 2011. Nice. All right. I'm sorry, what city did you say you're with? Oh, city of Victoria. Oh, wonderful. Welcome, Victoria. Um, and then Melissa, Melissa, thank you for some information in the chat. Um, Red Wing is one of the few cities that has a DC fast charger, and that was the one I talked about at the beginning um, in this municipal lot that's close to the retail areas. And here's the you know data. In 2018, it was $45. 2019, 940. Um, so that's a, a good chunk. And and just a note, Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that the chamber pays the electricity bill um, for um, the charger and then 310 through the end of June in 2020. Is that right that the chamber pays the electricity? Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Again, partnership man. <laughs> All right, well, let's move on. Um, 
thank you, Caitlin. That was wonderful. And I love it when cities chime in. I mean, this is a peer cohort. This is not just about us sharing information with you. This is about you sharing information with each other about your experience and what worked, what didn't work, tips you might have. So really, really appreciate that. So now we're going to have a little bit, um, we've had some good discussion, but, you know, continue on here. And I know there's a couple of cities that are going to hop in um, that have, you know, participated, have done some charging and, and might have some um, things to offer up. So, um, you know, I've divided this into, you know, two sections, like if you were, your city has already installed charging stations, so we'll talk about that for a few minutes and then we'll um, kind of um, ask some questions for cities that have not installed. So if your city has already installed charging stations, you know, kind of what were the benefits that you saw from partner, partnering? Um, you know, were there any drawbacks? Um, and did you use a different partner model than what we uh, presented earlier? Um, and so I know that Jen from Woodbury was maybe going to chime in and um, possibly Melissa from Red Wing, um, others perhaps. And sure, or this is Alan, Jen from McLaughlin. <laughs> Jen, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Okay. So this is Jen from Woodbury. Um, so we have not installed any charging stations yet, but we are um, definitely moving forward to try and get that done. We've done a couple of studies um, with a contractor on our city hall building and our healthy sports center to find out what we would need to do to retrofit those areas. Um, and then we are also have already retrofitted our fleet services building for five dual pedestals that we are um, hoping to get installed at least one or two by the end of this year. We have a meeting actually to get a bid this afternoon for that. But as far as the city hall, um, we're hoping to, well, we are participating in Excel's um, new program and um, the fleet electrification advisory program. It has some elements that are similar to fleet karma, which we, we uh, participated in previously, but this is with a different company and we are in the very beginning phases of this. We've just sent them our list of um, vehicles in our fleet, like with their, the VIN numbers, their year, make, model. Um, and so we're kind of, we've sent that over to the company, which is Sawatch Labs. And then we'll make decisions on what vehicles we want to put telemetrics in and they will monitor those vehicles for like charging and driving behavior. Well, I'm sorry, driving behavior and um, identify vehicles that could be uh, good candidates to switch out with an electric vehicle, but they're also going to put the telemetrics in our existing six plug-in hybrid electric vehicles to make sure that we're using those to um, their best capacity. And so we'll be looking at like the charging behavior for that and driving to make sure that we're making the most of the vehicles that we already do have in our uh, fleet. Because we're kind of at the point now where we have a lot of vehicle, or we have six vehicles that are plug-in hybrids, but we also need to um, make sure that we have a, a good charging infrastructure. And so Excel, once you go through this first part of the program, then you can apply for the Make Ready program, which um, pertains to uh, getting charging infrastructure in and they can help fund um, costs from what they're saying is like the transformer to the back of the um, charger. And so that's, we're really interested in that piece too, because I think that, um, and it only ha can be fleet, not city, um, or I'm sorry, not available to the public, oh. but just for the fleet. Right. But we will. K Caitlin, um, can you move to the next slide? take part in that also. Sorry. There we go. So I just pulled oh, okay, a, a quick slide. I just pulled a quick slide from Excel um, kind of to show folks. Obviously, you have to be an Excel Energy customer. My apologies to those cities that are not, but there are a number of cities that are Excel um, uh, utility um, customers. And so this is the fleet service pilot. Um, and and so they're, you know, they're helping with your fleet, but then once you kind of do this work and they do some analysis, um, then they, um, you know, will help you, that, you know, with 
some of the information um, and work on and start installing those chargers and you know um, to be eligible uh, your organization you know is, has to be a non-residential electric customer of Excel in Minnesota your organization is in the public sector your fleet operation hazard is planning to have at least five owned or leased electric vehicles within the next six months and that you agree to a minimum of four charging ports per site um, or a minimum of 50 kW of charging. And, you know, they have, there's some benefits, you know, installation of that make ready charging infrastructure, um, charging equipment options. And you can prepay the charger um, installation or do through a month monthly bundle on your bill. Um, they offer some low um, cost and EV charging rates and some upfront technical assistance. So it's a pretty good program. It's a pilot. Um, I talked to Excel Energy the other day and um, it's a pilot and you know some of them um, are you know taking you know taking applications and taking customers as um, you know on a rolling basis and some are doing it in batches so um, you know when we send out the information um, you know we'll send out the email um, of uh, the, the person you can contact to find out if they're still accepting folks for this um, pilot so that you can ask them about that but um, you know it it does, you know, take a lot of the guessing as far as, you know, which uh, they have some pre, um, pre-approved pre um, charging equipment options. And so it, it helps kind of give you some, some more um, assistance there. So thanks, Jen, for that. Anything else or any, you know, um, anything else you want to share on that? Nope, that's it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Caitlin, you can go back to the other slide. I just wanted to sh pop this up here to show folks. Sorry, thank you. Um, anyone else want to weigh in? You know, um, benefits you saw from partnering, um, drawbacks, different models. Sure, this is Ellen again from Shoreview. So you, uh, thanks Diana for showing our lovely picture there of our new charging station that we installed. I love uh, that picture. <laughs> in we actually installed two dual port charging stations. Um, both are level two and networked. Uh, and we worked, like you described a little bit, with uh, a local business in our area, Cummins, and also with GPI. So it was kind of a, a collaboration of all three of those. And some other folks uh, in that photo were from the city's Environmental Quality Committee. So there were definitely some residents that were pushing us forward as well. So that was great. Um, I think the, the partnership was really beneficial. This was something that the city was probably going to do anyway, but this partnership definitely moved it forward gave us some resources, made us more confident that what we, the decisions we were making in terms of location and, and whether or not to charge and what stations to install um, were the right ones. Um, so that was really helpful. We also got a sweet marketing plan from some uh, marketing professionals on the corporate side, which was great. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely think the partnership was wonderful. You know, big thanks to Diana and Chris and everybody who helped that go forward, absolutely. Um, and then I'll also just touch on the fact uh, we're, we're doing the same program that Jen is doing. Uh, we're a little bit further along. SawWatch has had telemetrics data in 10 of our vehicles, no, 12, 12 of our vehicles um, for a couple months now. So they're gathering data on, actually most of the ones we're, we're testing are some of our light duty trucks. So we'll see if we'll be switching Ooh. out some light duty trucks to Nissan Leafs or maybe a Bolt um, or maybe some other SUV type of electric vehicle. We'll, We'll take a look at that. Um, we're still in the early stages. They need 90 days worth of data, but we're getting there. Um, and then hopefully we can switch over some uh, some of our fleet vehicles. We currently don't have any. We had a, a non-plug-in hybrid, but we, you know, they, they traded that one in last year. So it didn't, we didn't move forward with that. So hopefully we can get some plug-in electric um, and then participate in Excel's program that you just talked about. So that'd be great. That's awesome. I'm curious um, if you're um, a city that is participating in that pilot, could you just put a note in the chat? I'm just curious which cities that are part of that pilot. That's um, it's interesting. And when we get to the sessions um, on fleet, um, we'll probably um, talk more about that and maybe even ask Excel to come in and talk about that program. And again, I know that that doesn't apply to everyone, um, um, but there aren't a lot of um, utilities that have you know kind of a program quite like that um, so i think it's interesting and maybe you can use that to push your utility to have a program like that um, great um, oh so red wing is participating awesome thanks melissa um diana go ahead this is brandy yeah. 
Um, really tailing right off of that, what you said is pushing your local cooperatives or local retailers um, we have five utilities on the reservation, and when we did the project with VW and on our own, because we had two projects going on, we took it to them and presented it to them, and they had money to put towards this. So even if they don't have an official thing, they still have to do some mandates, even with rural cooperatives, they still have to do some type of mandate. And you may be able to want to pull them out of a, a predicament they didn't know how to fix. So it doesn't, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know until you ask. Yeah, help, help them help you. Got it. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Um, so maybe I'll just throw this out, um, you know, on the, for the cities that um, have not installed, you know, we talked about, some different, you know, partnership opportunities, you know, what, you know, as you think about this and as you've been listening, you know, which of those roles do you want to play as far as first the role that you can play as a city? Um, and again, like Caitlin said, you don't have to just choose one, you can do more than one. Um, you know, any thoughts or ideas you have for potential partners after hearing some of these partnership um, ideas? Um, you know, are there upcoming opportunities to partner in your community? Uh, with, you know, again, a big opportunity is when parking lots or ramps are being redeveloped or redeveloped as a great opportunity to lay that conduit and get going on a, on a charger, even if it's laying the conduit for a future charger. So that, those are really great opportunities. And um, if there are, what are the, if you're not doing anything, you know, kind of what are the key barriers? So um, cities that have not installed um, that want to um, share what they're thinking. This is uh, Bill Kennedy from Hackensack, and I posted a question there too about are there any other small cities, but we're a small city. We don't have a charging station. We are looking to put one in, and I think some of our major concerns uh, are basically where to put it. And of course, small cities, less infrastructure, less, um, I, I consider less organized, you know, street, you know, with curb gutter sidewalks, you know where to put it and our biggest thing that we've been trying to struggle with is snow removal when we put this mm -hmm. thing in we blow snow all over it what then you know that kind of thing too so that's i think those are some mm -hmm. of our concerns i think it's less of a concern of the the initial cost although i think we were considering a dumb terminal and not charging mm -hmm. anybody for it just because mm -hmm. of cost and also the location i think we identified um is sort of temporary because we need to, we, you know, we potentially would put this in, but uh, we have some road construction happening right in the same area next summer, and we're gonna have to just mm -hmm. move the whole thing anyway. So I don't know, mm -hmm. those are some of the concerns that we have right now, but. Yeah, so that's, that's great. Thank you for chiming in. Uh, two things I will say um, is first, uh, next, next week, we're gonna talk about siting considerations. So we're gonna talk a lot about where to locate a charger. So that that will probably be a meeting that, you know, you or your compadres want to participate in to kind of hear more about that. Um, you know, remind me who your, who's your um, utility? Uh, Minnesota Power. Okay. And Minnesota Power has some EV programs. And so I would, you know, definitely reach out um, to them. And um, the, they have a new staff person, Yousef, who, um, used to work for a, a different um, co-op up on, uh, on the North Shore and um, I would reach out to them and talk to them about what you know how they can be helpful. Um, I'm not as familiar with their programs, uh, maybe Caitlin is, but um, so definitely turn in, tune in next week um, for the siting considerations and you know um, so it sounds like you're thinking about putting in a, a charger but then you'd have to move it next year or next summer during construction you might want to rethink where it's going to be or wait till the construction. I hate to say, I don't like to tell people to wait to install a charger, but um, you know, putting it in and then moving it, you know, six or eight months later might not, not be the right decision. I, I don't know that it matters where we, where we want it after the construction versus now. I, I, 
I think, you know, it's, it's all going to get torn up. It's, we're doing a major re reconstruction of a road and actually moving it like 20 feet to the side. So that's mm, part okay. of it. The other places we looked at putting it, we have other, again, snow removal or snow push, you know, mm -hmm. concern. Mm -hmm. that they're yep. just going to be destroyed. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. And trying to make it publicly friendly. You know, I guess we were looking at our park, you know, putting it down by our park because during the summer, mm -hmm. that's where we think people would really want to use it. Otherwise, we could mm -hmm. put it closer to things like City Hall, but like who really wants to park in front of City Hall when the park's down the road, you yeah. know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. No, I think those are really good questions and we'll talk much more about that next week. So definitely tune in next week. Um, Anyone else? And then I'm probably going to move to um, some other uh, some follow-ups and reminders. But you know, we got a couple more minutes here. Um, just wanted to make the point, and I think Diana, you referenced this, but you know, we have a bullet here of like parking lots and ramps being developed or redeveloped. Um, you know, Bill and Anne kind of touched on this, but when you're looking to redevelop or, you know, repave a road and it's getting torn up anyway, that's a great opportunity to put in some charging infrastructure and you don't even have to put in the actual station. You can simply lay conduit for future charging stations. So look for opportunities like those that are happening in your community because it's going to be a lot less expensive to lay down that conduit during redevelopment than to go back in later and dig up con concrete. Yeah, and then um, Brandy just said Minnesota Power was a great partner for us. They have some type of program for sustainability that EV fits into. So yeah, they're, I, again, I'm not as familiar with the Minnesota Power programs, but I would reach out to Minnesota Power, um, you know, for their assistance um they have um two staff people that have been um that are working on evs there if folks don't have any other um thoughts um to jump in um i think we'll move forward so just a reminder um uh we have our meeting, it's actually September 10th, that says the 9th, it's actually September 10th next week, um, and that will be all about citing considerations, both where in your community to put it, and then where at that site, you know, so you decide this parking lot, um, great, that's the location in your community, but then where um, in that parking lot makes most sense for citing um, the charger. Um, as we talked about earlier, um, there are, Volkswagen grants open right now. Um, so the electric vehicle DC fast charging, they're often referred to as DC, FC, or fast chargers. The station grant came out last Thursday. Um, it closes November 25th, so there's quite a bit of time. And again, that is not, um, the, the applicants um, have to apply to develop all of the chargers on a particular corridor. So this is not likely going to be a city. Um, there's developers that are going to be doing that. Um, again, we have that VW webinar. We'll send a link for that. Um, but it is, you know, if you're, you know, if you're on one of those corridors and you want to host one, it's good to talk to, you know, potential developers that are putting in um, those charging stations to let them know that you want to be a community host and um, they will work with you. Um, in addition to the, the electric vehicle charging, we wanted to make sure that you knew about the electric school bus pilot project. Um, that is out right now, and that closes on October 13th. Um, and so, you know, if you have a close relationship with your school and, and your school might be, you know, school district might be interested, um, definitely reach out to them and make sure that they know about this. Um, there's still, you know, uh, what is that, six weeks or so, so there's still time to put in an application, but um, you want, might want to look at that as well. And then um, we've got a, a, the other one that came out earlier this summer was the Clean Diesel Off-Road DARA grant. Um, and that's about 1.1 million and it closes on September 18th. Um, we will send a link with information so you can look at the um, Pollution Control Agency website and see all of the RFPs and information. And they do have um, 
webinars that they do to answer questions, etc. So that. Um, thank you so much. Um, so happy to be back with um, cities um, for cities charging ahead. Um, great to see um, some familiar faces and excited to have new cities that have joined in and um, look forward to um, seeing you again next week. Um, Caitlin or Chris, I don't know if you have anything else. Did I miss anything that we should share? Um, National Drive Electric Week is coming up September 26th is when it starts. So yeah, we'll get more information out about uh, what Drive Electric Minnesota and GPI is going to be doing. I'll just do a preview that it's, we're going to use the hashtag I drive electric and we're really trying to show the the people and the vehicles, the variety of people and vehicles that drive electric across Minnesota in 2020. Um, now we have an electric vehicle registered in every single county. So we're very excited about that and we want to show your faces and vehicles. So um, yeah, we'll have more information. We'll probably go into that a little bit more next week just to, you know, make sure you know. All right, it's 1130. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye now.